Women's History Month, and who better to celebrate women working in the workplace than entrepreneur, job creator, business renegade, Lynn Tilton of Patriarch Partners. Thank you so much for joining us, Lynn. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. Uh, you know, I've, uh, I was, as I was preparing for this, you know, I, I, I realized like how closely I followed your career, literally when I started on Wall Street and now, you know, leading, leading the street here. And I've read so many different things about you from, you know, you're brash, you're fearless, you're over the top. So who is Lynn Tilton? Take us through who you are. Um, probably alone and unafraid is how uh, an army general described me recently. Uh, leadership is really a lonely path. And I would say that my life has, in the last couple of decades, been devoted to job creation, um, giving people the dignity of work, and leading companies from times of despair and loss to times of prosperity and light. And in that, you make a lot of difficult decisions, and not everybody loves you. Uh, but that's really who I am. And what I'm most proud of is the 243 companies that we've restructured, and many of which we've saved, and the 700,000 people that I've taken on that journey with me. You know, Lynn, uh, take us back to the early years. I believe you, you grew up uh, in the Bronx. You know, as a young adult or even before that, what do you think set you up for your current success? You know, well, we all have key points in our lives, and I'm curious, what were some of the key points in your life in those early years that set you up for today? I, you know, I had a father who was near perfect, a genius, a world-class athlete who wanted the same of his children, and I think my fear of mediocrity and fear of disappointing him uh, was a driving force. I mean, uh, and when he died when I was 19, uh, that was probably the seminal moment in my life where I wanted to live a life where I could honor him in how I lived. Uh, he taught us that our lives would be defined not by what we did for ourselves, but uh, what we did for others. And so I think that making my father proud was very important to me. I think being a nationally ranked tennis player and playing for Yale uh, taught me uh, sort of the discipline and the dedication of striving for excellence. Uh, it also taught me, you know, that you're alone and that, you know, your success and failure rests on your own shoulders and yet other people are counting on you. So I think I, I learned a lot from being a uh, competitive athlete at a young age. Um, and then being a mother, you know, at 22 and a single mother by 23, uh, I've had to care for people my whole life. And I think that that has defined, you know, how I behave and how important it is to me to sort of nurture and teach and take people with me. So I think those would probably be the three things that have defined me most, being a competitive athlete, living to honor my father's values, and being a single mother with survival being the noblest of my causes. No, it's a phenomenal story, Lynn. You know, it, do you, it's one point, and you're playing tennis, and you're, you're competing so aggressively. Uh, did you imagine you, you would have uh, a career on Wall Street in business? Is it something you planned out, or you just got taken down that path? No, it was never my plan. Uh, you know, I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to continue to play tennis. I went to Yale. I studied literature and history. Uh, but when my father died when I was 19 and I had a teenage brother and a mother that I needed to help support, when I graduated from Yale, I just asked people uh, what were the best jobs because all I had really done was play tennis. And they said that the best paying jobs and the most competitive jobs were on Wall Street. And so I raised my hand and ended up at Morgan Stanley. Uh, so that was truly, truly not my plan. And then, of course, I very quickly became a mother and then a single mother. And so I was somewhat uh, dug in to the Wall Street path and didn't really love it um, until I 
started this business, but it was my path and I tried to put my head down and learn as much as I could because even though women were not treated equally, I realized that my talent and my knowledge was something that no one could ever take from me and that someday that I would be able to use that to spread my wings and fly and do the things that make my heart beat fast. Now, Blitz, take us through that. Uh, when you, that, I don't know, those first six months in the job in, in a Morgan Stanley or an investment bank, uh, I imagine for, for many women on Wall Street today, it's your experience when you first started is completely different. What was it like back then? And do you see any similarities in there now? Look, I don't think Wall Street has has ever been a place that has been kind to women, and in partly it in part it's it's the lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Uh, my first six months were working a minimum of a hundred hours a week, uh, day and night. I was in the M and A department. I also think it was a very different time. I mean, there were very few people hired into the analyst positions back in 1981. When I came out of Yale, I was actually the only person from Yale hired at Morgan Stanley for that year. It was a different kind of prestige, uh, but you paid a price for that, and you you worked around the clock. Um, I think I still have the most reported hours ever at Morgan Stanley in one week, which was 138 hours of working hours. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and yet I and yet I work pretty much consistently that number of hours uh, uh, these days. Uh, nothing's as intense as it has become for me uh, at Patriarch. But yes, I was known as the fire drill queen. They used my uh, sort of athletic uh, background and my motivation for perfection, and they used me well. But look, women always have that decision that they have to make on their lifestyle and childbearing um, and whether they have that pathway to the top. And I think that when women face that issue, if they're not truly in love with what they do and they're not able to sort of believe that they are open to the top positions, that often women drop out. Mm -hmm. And you know, it was a tough environment. And for me, once I was a single mother, it was nearly brutal because I could never admit that I needed to be home or I needed to go to a school or go to a doctor. And so I had to really live as if I was not a mother in order to be able to keep my job. And my 30s and my 20s were really so dark and so difficult that I often say I don't really remember them other than in shadowy detail because I was afraid every day, afraid that I would lose my job and not be able to support my daughter or that I would be a terrible mother. And so that those years were marked by fear for me and desperation. And I think it's one of the reasons that I'm unafraid today because at one point I decided that I would never be afraid again that I would not have the paralysis of fear mark my path. And so I'm always ready to fight the battles that come for my people, for my companies, um, for my integrity. And I refuse to back off because of fear or the fear of what people will say about me. Um, And I think that came from being so afraid and the damage that fear does to a lifestyle or a career in, in those years when I was really in a position where that no other woman my age was in mm-hmm. at an investment bank. You know, take me through the, the first, I mean, that's a big switch to go from a, a, somewhat of a, a somewhat of a stable environment from an investment bank culture to starting Patriot Partners, what I'm guessing over what, 20 years, what, 20 years ago, what was, what were those first days like? I mean, that I'm sure a lot of fear, a lot of unknown? Really not, um, which is surprising. Um, I had enough money by the time I started Patriarch to really retire with, well, and, and everything's, you know, in context, but I had saved $10 million over the years because I had had my own business before Patriarch for a couple of years where I did very well. 
And I had really been planning to retire because I really wanted to do something different with my life. Um, I'd been working for others since I was 13 years old, um, even worked full time uh, from the time I was a teenager. And I really had a calling. I believed in what I was going to do with such a passion and certainty of the future that there was no decision to make. Mm -hmm. I, I realized that this was exactly the way that I could prove that making money and the, making the world a better place were not mutually exclusive options. And that this was a path that had been set for me. So there was no fear. Mm -hmm. was sort of belief, there was a focus, um, almost maniacal, on being able to get that first deal done, which was built on a patented model that I had built, and a journey that I knew I had to take. You know, what, uh, you know, we're sitting here recently, some of the news and the headlines, there was a two-man race at, at Goldman Sachs, and one guy left, and one guy is going to get it. You know, what do you think needs to change to get where is, the, where is the female investment banking CEO? Why is she not in discussion? Why are there not more females in the boardroom? What do you think is going on here and what do we need to do to make it, uh, make it more diverse finally? I, I gave a speech yesterday to a Yale Women's Forum and it's the advice that I impart to women every day and that's our destinies will change when we begin by being kind to each other. I think the first step is women supporting women. I think men will catch on. I think we too often believe there's only one spot for a woman and we have to compete with each other to get there. So I think that's the first step is, you know, being there for each other, supporting each other and realizing there's not room for only one, but that shoulder to shoulder, walking in the same direction, we can be the greatest force of nature. And then it's perception, you know, it's media perception. It's, you know, how women are always sort of put out there as targets. Uh, I really think that that has to change too. And I think, you know, women are often so badly treated in the top roles that I think that sometimes keeps boards from choosing women because they, they're afraid that that backlash will come back to the company rather than realizing that women bring a creativity to the table because we're creators by nature that aren't all, often found in men. But I think those are some of the issues. I mean, I often speak at Yale to certain law school classes and business school classes, and I'm very active in the Women's Business National Council giving speeches to women. And I really think that, you know, we have to begin with each other. I mean, I'm always surprised when I'm so badly attacked by other women, because for me, it's so important to inspire them to be able to reach back and help them on that journey. And it's not going to change. Uh, women also drop out of the race, even though they graduate at the top of their classes and are equally strong and smart because they don't see that future to the top. And so it's not worth the sacrifice, but it does need to change. I mean, it really it, does need to change. I mean, is it, is it, I won't say ridiculous that it's 2018 and we're having this conversation. Uh, I mean, it's a conversation that needs to happen, but what ultimately gets us that change that is so badly needed? Look, I don't think much has changed in the, and I'm embarrassed to admit it, but the 37 years that I've been in the business world, I don't think it is much better for women today. Perhaps the sexual harassment um, and the discrimination isn't as outright and bold, but in the end, we're not seeing more women uh, on a wholesale basis making it to the top of their field. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think the media could be much more helpful in not making women always the targets and the takedown stories. I mean, you know, activist investors go after female CEOs. You know, the media loves to take down 
females in the top positions. Yesterday, after I spoke to this group of women, their first question to me is, would you do anything differently? And of course, my answer was, there are so many things I would do different. But the first and foremost is I would not underestimate how unattractive a successful woman is to the world. And I would have better protected myself. You know, you made a good point there too. You must have, I don't know, you must have saw my notes. <laughs> but the activist investing, uh, we are seeing that a lot of that uh, where the activists are targeting women. Uh, do you think they're doing it on purpose? Uh, and what is the outcome of that? Uh, I think they are. I mm-hmm. think I think people see female as weaker, as those who will back down in a fight, and those that the boards will uh, give up on if the the media gets too ugly mm-hmm. in in terms of that battle. Um, I think the SEC came after me because I was a high profile target woman, and it was a witch hunt. So. I think that women are looked at as the weaker sex and women will not take on the fight. And I don't necessarily disagree that women won't take on the fight. I certainly do not see them as the weaker sex, but I think often women do not like the ugliness. I know I don't like the ugliness Um, and they will back off. And until that stops, until women have the support when people come after them, either by boards or by media uh, or other supporters who will speak out publicly, then we proliferate that weaker sex impression and we allow it to continue to happen. But I think definitely men think if they come hard enough at women, they will back off and they will give up. That's one of the reasons I fight so hard. Yeah, that's not the, I mean, obviously that's not, the case. I mean, if you had to say, if you had an activist investor in, in, in your bar room, what would you say to them? Well, I basically do have activist investors in my boardroom. It's not, it's not. Um, look, in the end, you know, I believe in truth and justice. I believe ultimately the truth will be told. And I don't back down because I have too many people to protect. And, you know, no one's going to further hurt me in what they say about me or, or, or how they treat me. That in the end, I don't lose one minute of sleep any night over my behavior or my integrity. There are a lot of things I would do over again. I'm an imperfect being, but my integrity is not imperfect. And therefore I can stand up to any battle or in the face of my mother, God, or country on any actions I do take. And that's my comfort. But I also have a lot of people to protect. Mm -hmm. You know, I have tens of thousands of employees and they are counting on me to protect them. And that makes it very easy to stand up to the battle. But I'm not sure that it's the women themselves who give up or it's the boards who ultimately give up when women are the targets and being you know, demeaned in these actions and in the papers. But I always try when another woman is under attack to reach out because I think when we give each other strength and when we're not afraid to stand by each other's side, that will go a long way. I mean, I mean it when I say that our destinies will change when we're kind and supportive to each other. The rest of the world will catch on, but it starts with us. Sure. You know, I wanted to just touch upon your uh, businesses just a little bit. You know, when you, uh, is how are your businesses doing right now? Is it easier or harder to operate, let's say, under the, under the current administration? What trends are you seeing in your business? Just curious. I mean, you have such a diverse portfolio. I'm such a diverse. So it's certainly the defense business is very good, and I'm very grateful. <laughs> I'm actually talking to you from, from MD Helicopters today, mm-hmm. uh, where I'm working to fulfill a very large army contract right now. Uh, I, think, I think the biggest thing that every company faces right now, the largest challenge, is the innovation revolution. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's what we all have to look at is 
there are, there's a real shifting uh, of businesses and, and how you have to deal with them based on products and based on disruption, right? You know, if you're going up against Amazon or you're going up against Elon Musk at Tesla, everyone has to understand that things are going to change and you can't do things or run your businesses the same way that you've run them in the past. Mm -hmm. But it's certainly been helped to have a low interest rate environment. And I think the most important thing is product development. You know, are you keeping pace with innovation? Um, every business works from the customer backward and everything begins with product. And there are two things people want from product. They want design and disruption. They want to be enveloped in elegance and beauty, and they want to be excited by innovation and technology. And it doesn't matter whether I'm creating a new eyeshadow or a new weapons system or an advanced driving system, it all applies. Mm -hmm. So I would say that my portfolio is always bifurcated. You know, every company I've ever bought was days away from liquidation and left for dead. So I have some companies that are doing extremely well and which I'm very proud of. And I have other companies that are struggling under the disruption of major players changing industries. But certainly this is a more business friendly environment. And as someone who has long been a proponent of making things in America, uh, I think having that backing is a very good thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I've long believed that we should make things uh, where we you know, build them, where we sell them. Uh, and so for me, having that mentality, which I always found as an obstacle in the past, but people is so much, sort of wind beneath my wings at the moment, uh, that's very exciting to me. You know, do you go to bed or do you think about throughout the day a trade war? I mean, we hear this constantly around the clock. And as somebody so focused on making things in America, do you worry about this? Do you even think about it? Yeah, of course I think about it. Look, I have long believed that there has been a disparity in the price of raw materials around the world, that there are foreign countries that subsidize raw materials which makes it impossible for American manufacturing to compete. Uh, you know, in a manufacturing company, your material is anywhere from 50 to 70% of your costs. Therefore, if it's subsidized by 30%, you know, you've got 15 to 21% that you have to make up and that's impossible. So I, you know, I understand that tariffs could make sense if there's dumping going on, but you have to be thoughtful about why you're imposing tariffs and you have to communicate those reasons for it because it will become, you know, like whack-a-mole, you know, this one, you get this, but then you lose this. And so for me, it's not so much the tariffs, it's the reasoning behind the tariffs and whether there's, sort of a negotiating point to that to just make commodities and raw materials the same price everywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. But I, I lose sleep over a lot of things. Mm -hmm. um, this is not the first on my list, but it is definitely on my list. Let's be honest, Lynn, you don't really sleep. No, I don't really sleep. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm paying a dear price for that. Oh, come on. Uh, just a couple more for you. You know, how do you, so when you go into these distressed companies, how do you, how do you turn them around? You know, we talk. I, we're looking at the news uh, over the past week. Uh, a Toys R Us just didn't survive. How do you go in there and, and change things up? Well, look, I'm I'm an imperfect being too. I'm, I mean, the you have to you know you have to look at your environment. But most important, as I said, my main focus these days is on product and innovation, because. It used to be that restructuring a broken company was really all about the expenses and the liability side of a balance sheet. Usually it was over levered, it had built up big costs, revenues were going down, and you could almost stabilize it just by structural changes. And I used to say you have to put five fingers where the blood's flowing and drive 
the future with the palm of your other hand because if you just stop the blood by the time you finished, you were drowning because you hadn't innovated. But never before today is, is innovation more important because the trajectory of change has accelerated exponentially. So for me, the most important thing is dreaming the future because in the end, most companies become distressed because their revenues fall, because their products are not competitive. And if I can't leapfrog over where others are today, then I can't take this company into the future. Companies really come down to, I, uh, you know, I'm always leading a lot of different companies, so I try to distill information into the smallest form. But our job is to create propensity or growth. And that formula is people times plan, times process, times pace. That means you have to have the right people in the right places. Nothing can replace that. That's the most important. The plan is not your numerical plan, but it's the qualitative vision. It's the strategy. What will my products be? What geographic distribution? Who are my customers? Who are my vendors? When I close my eyes and dream the future, that's a helicopter overhead. That's the sound of money. I apologize for the noise. But when I dream the future, what does this company look like? And the process is the invisible web of energy that allows every person who comes to work, whether there are 500 employees or 10,000 employees, know exactly what they have to do each day to participate in driving that plan. And that's everything from financial models to, you know, program management to, you know, distinct processes that have to cover how people behave each day and governance. And then the paces, if you're not operating with a sense of urgency, you will not get there. And that's how I look at it. But the innovation revolution is what will be the biggest challenge as we have continued disruptors taking market share and changing how we do business. You've got to see it very quickly on where it's going and jump on the bandwagon. I mean, five years ago, I bought a Tesla and moved it into the showroom and took it apart piece by piece. And I made a decision at that moment that I believed that the EV and, and an autonomous car was going to be the future. And I started moving our products towards that at my automotive company. And, you know, today our biggest products are, you know, battery trays and, you know, the future of infotainment and advanced driving. So you have to make bets and you've got to see trends, especially if you're not going to be the major disruptor in an industry. Oh, Lynn, Lynn, tell did you tell me you, you took apart a Tesla? Yeah, I mean, I learned my businesses bottom up. Every business that I run, I have to learn part by part, piece by piece. Otherwise, I can't dream the future. So, you know, I, I can take a helicopter apart too. But that's the way I had to learn what the pieces were and, and where I thought things were going to drive the strategy for the future of that company. I want, you know, I know everybody sees me in a certain light, but I spend most of my life on a manufacturing line. Mm-hmm. Lynn, I'm, 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 I'm tweeting this. I'm, we'll be tweeting this at, at Elon Musk, just, <laughs> just so you know when this hits up, it's gone. Just uh, two, two more and, for you. Two more and you can tell him I'm also driving one. Okay, all right, fair enough. That's good, that's good. <laughs> um, what's your advice to young women, women who see you, they look at your career and say, hey, I want to be like her. How can they replicate your career? I think it's about passion and perseverance. Uh, For me, believing so fully in what I do today uh, and not giving up. I think most people lose in life because they give up, not because the end result is a loss. And so I think that you have to dream the dream and fight for that dream. But most important, realize that leadership is a lonely path and grab a friend (laughs) and take that person with you because that's the most difficult part. 
of what I do is I have to lead so many through so much and you can't ever instill fear in others. I mean, you have to be present every day and offer people protection and comfort. And it's much easier to do it with someone by your side. Mm -hmm. Uh, Landon, on this, uh, what would you like your legacy to be? I would like it to be defined by the companies that I put back out in the world that would otherwise have not had life. And by the number of lives that I touched, the jobs that were here that would not have been here, especially during our darkest moments during, you know, the great recession, but really about who I inspired, who I helped um, and who I was able to take on this journey with me. That's the legacy I want. Well, Lintel, thank you so much for, for joining us. This is a fascinating discussion that uh, I know I will be listening to over and over again. Thank you so much. My pleasure, and thank you.